So how can you increase the chances of your offer being accepted in a competitive real estate market? In this video, I'll share with you five tricks that I currently use to get sellers to agree to accept my offers, even though I offer less than the property's market value. And if you stick around all the way to the end of this video, I will share with you a bonus tip, which will make it even more likely that your next offer gets accepted. Coming up. Hey guys, if we're just meeting, my name is Vitaly Volpov. I'm a real estate investor, attorney, and a part owner of a real estate brokerage in upstate New York. I currently own over 100 rental units, and my goal is to help 1,000 other like-minded people reach financial independence through real estate investing. Please like, follow, and subscribe if you find this video helpful. All right, guys, jumping right into it, trick number one is to offer a higher good faith deposit, also referred to as the earnest money deposit. For those who don't know, a good faith deposit is a portion of the purchase price, which is usually provided to a seller's agent or attorney at the time the seller and the buyer come to terms on a purchase. It is usually held in an escrow account until the closing, at which time it gets paid over to the seller and credited against the purchase price. However, depending on the terms of the purchase agreement, if the deal doesn't close due to some failure on the part of the buyer, for which there was no corresponding contingency, the seller gets to keep the good faith deposit as the seller's compensation for having his or her property taken off the market and for foregoing opportunities to potentially sell it to someone else. So naturally, the high higher the deposit, the more money the seller may end up keeping if the deal falls through. Depending on the average prices in your market, the standard good faith deposit may be $1,000 or $5,000 or $10,000. There is usually a customary amount that every real estate investor offers as a deposit and it usually doesn't vary too much with the purchase price unless the price is significantly more or less than the average. Recently, I have seen a lot of $2,500 and $5,000 deposits in my area. So how can you use the deposit to your advantage when trying to secure a deal. Assuming you have sufficient funds for this, you can offer more than what is currently the standard amount in your local market. So if the standard deposit is, for example, $5,000, if you offer, say, $10,000, that will make your offer incrementally more attractive to a seller. The more money you offer to put in escrow, the more confident that a seller will feel that you will do everything you can to close. This by itself will not likely get you the deal, but when you combine it with the other tricks I will talk about, it will make your offer that much more competitive. Trick number two is to provide a solid proof of funds. Whether you're planning to pay all cash, use private or hard money financing, or use bank financing, you should absolutely have a letter or a statement from the third party who's providing you the funds, indicating that you have enough funds available to close the deal at the price at which you offered. Don't overlook this. If a seller has two identical offers, but one of them includes a letter from a lender stating that the buyer has been pre-approved or has access to sufficient cash funds, the seller will likely go with that buyer as opposed to one who still needs to get their financing in order. Again, this is not something that by itself will allow you to get a lowball offer accepted, but it will help to get a competitive offer to the finish line. Trick number three is to waive the financing contingency. A financing contingency is a term in most purchase offers that allows the buyer to cancel a transaction after the buyer's offer was accepted by the seller on the basis of the buyer failing to obtain sufficient financing. Obviously, sellers are not particularly keen on having to give the buyer a month or two to find out whether or not they will have the money to close, all the while tying up the property and preventing other potential buyers from closing on it. If you can waive this contingency, your offer will appear that much stronger to the seller. Of course, it goes without saying that waiving this contingency shifts the risk of failing to obtain financing entirely on you, and you may end up losing your good faith deposit, or worse, may end up getting sued for other damages incurred by the seller as a result of your failure. But if you feel confident in your source of funds or are able to offer all cash together with the other tricks I already discussed, this will make your offer begin to stand out above the rest, even if it's at a lower price than someone else's. Trick number four is to waive the inspection contingency and buy the property as is. Similar to the financing contingency, most standard form contracts have what's called an inspection contingency. An inspection contingency allows the buyer within a set period of time to have the property inspected by a licensed inspector or some other third party to determine whether there are any major defects in the structure of the property. If problems are found pursuant to the contingency, the buyer typically has the ability to either back out of the deal entirely or request that the seller take money off. Waiving this contingency is usually a very big deal. Sellers, as a general matter, and especially sellers who are 
are trying to sell all their multifamily properties absolutely dread inspections. Almost always the inspector hired by the buyer will be able to find some kind of major defect in the property during an inspection, which will mean that whether the sale occurs is entirely within the buyer's discretion. Imagine the seller getting two offers. One of them offers exactly what the seller is asking, but comes with an inspection contingency, while the other offer comes in at $10,000 less, but waives the inspection contingency. With an older property, it is almost certainly true that the seller will favor the offer that doesn't come with an inspection. Given the fact that inspections can possibly result in a buyer demanding tens of thousands of dollars in credits, thereby significantly reducing a seller's profit, if you could come with an offer which waives an inspection contingency and uses the other tricks I talked about, your offer will have a very high chance of being accepted even if it's not the highest. I have been able to get pretty substantial discounts on properties I bought simply by waiving the inspection contingency. With with that said, this may not necessarily be the best move for everyone. In fact, if you are new to the game, if you've never done a deal before, and don't have any reliable maintenance workers or contractors, you probably should not try to use this trick. As with the financing contingency, if you waive the inspection contingency, you will shift all of the risk onto yourself and you won't have that safety net to fall back on. So unless you trust your ability to accurately assess a building from a mechanical and structural standpoint, and you feel confident that you can handle any unknown issues that can come up, you should not use this trick. It can be a big negotiating advantage or it can be a costly mistake. Trick number five is providing several alternative offers. There's an old sales tactic employed in many different industries of providing a consumer with several pricing options with the intent of getting the consumer to pick one of them. When a person is given one offer to buy or sell something, they're likely to subconsciously view it as having two choices. Choice A is accept the offer and choice B is to not accept the offer. Depending on the terms of the offer and numerous other variables specific to the situation, they may accept it or they may not. If the offer is not irresistibly good, they're likely to be pretty indifferent and can just as easily walk away as accept or counter the offer. However, if the same consumer is given multiple alternative offers instead of just one, now they subconsciously start comparing each of the offers to the other and the option of simply declining all of them gets pushed further back down the line. To use this psychology to your advantage in real estate, you can come up with two and preferably three different offers which are all advantageous to you. For example, let's say a seller is asking $130,000 for their property. Your offer number one to him might be an all-cash purchase price of $100,000. Offer number two might have a $130,000 purchase price, but come with 100% seller financing at 6% interest over the next 15 years. And offer number three might be a $115,000 purchase price with 50% cash and 50% seller financing, but a 4% interest over 25 years. The key here is that the seller is being offered several options to choose from. While the option to say no thank you to all of them is still there, it will be much further from the seller's mind because the seller would be preoccupied in comparing the different offers you just gave them. Now the seller may ultimately want to negotiate some modified version of one of your offers, but the point is that applying the strategy, you got him to engage in negotiation, which is much more likely to result in a deal for you. So those are the five tricks that I have personally used to scale my portfolio to over 100 rental units over the last five years. Now for the bonus tip that I mentioned at the beginning of this video that will make these five tricks even more effective. It is that you need to connect with these sellers before they put their properties on the market. If you've been trying to buy investment properties on the MLS the last few years, chances are you have had a very hard time finding deals with numbers that make sense. And that is because of the competitive nature of on-market real estate. By definition, when a property hits the market, all the other investors in the market see the same deal as you at the same time. Naturally, high demand creates high competition, which in turn makes for higher asking prices and lower returns for you. If you could shortcut the process and get to those sellers before they post their property to the masses, and if you also use utilize the five tricks I just mentioned, I can almost guarantee that you will be able to buy a good deal. Now you might say, well, sure, getting an off-market deal would be great, but how the hell do I find one? For the answer to that question, I would encourage you to watch my video on the five strategies for finding off-market deals. You can find it on my YouTube channel, and I'll also put a link to it in the description and the comments below. Give this video a thumbs up if you found it useful, and if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe for more content like this. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.